Welcome to The Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on the world of high-performance computing. Today, my guest is from SSR Labs. We have the president and CEO of the company, Axel Cloth. Axel, hey, welcome to the show today. Thank you. Great. So let's have the title slide and let me explain why we are doing what we are doing. So you see the tagline being energy and instruction efficient high performance computing. And I did that to point out that high performance computing will have to be more and more energy efficient and instruction efficient for us to make use of it because as we've already seen a bunch of times, the traditional approaches didn't quite work out well and had to be revised. And so this is why we rethought all of high performance computing, not only when it comes to the individual chips powering the system, but also the total performance package you get out of it. And the second thing that may strike you as interesting is the fact that the company is called Scalable Systems Research Labs, which of course is a play on Spark, the scalable processor architecture. So we wanted to pick up where they basically stopped and made sure that computer systems that are deployed in high-performance computing scale with a number of cores nicely when they deploy our solutions. And I'll explain why that is the case and why that's important. Let's go to the next slide which is relatively sparse, the big data challenge. I think everybody at this point in time has heard about the big data challenge, and that's only one of the things that makes up high-performance computing, but it's a big and material part of it. We need to be able to achieve accuracy and the speed goals, and at the same time solve the power equals heat problem, because ultimately the amount of power we can feed into a data center is limited not only because power is limited, but also the ability to remove heat is limited if we don't really want to go to water cooling. And I don't think that any of the big data center operators are ready yet to go to water cooling. Thus, we need to be able to cool with air. And that means we can get about to a 70 to maximum, maybe 100 watt per liter density of heat generated, which of course means that Once we know the volume of the data center, we know the volume or we know the total heat that we can remove. Thus, we know the amount of watts we can feed in. And that determines with a limited and well-known number about the energy density and the performance density, how much performance we can get per data center. And of course, everybody wants to have more and more performance, right? I mean, all data center operators and customers want and need an ever-increasing amount of compute performance. And as a result, we need to be able to increase that total performance without substantially increasing the power consumption, thus increasing the need for bigger and bigger and more data centers. And that's what we are setting out to do. And I'll show you how we did it and why we did what we did. Let's go to the next slide. And you see that nice eBay dashboard, and while all of the big operators of data centers know what their performance is and know what their power consumption is, none of them, as far as I know, publish it except for eBay. eBay is very open on this, and I really like that because it shows how many transactions you get per kilowatt hour. And in that particular example I picked out, eBay shows that they get 40 5,914 transactions per kilowatt hour. And that by itself is actually a pretty good number. But the issue is, of course, if they have a fixed size of the data center that they have and a fixed amount of energy they can feed in, but the number of users grows and the number of transactions needs to grow, they have to do something that is not the traditional way to do it. And more importantly, we've all heard about the actual and the perceived and forecast end of Moore's law and that kind of scaling. Thus, we have to do something else. And I think this is a very nice intro into why we need better power and instruction efficiency in processors to get high performance compute. And I include, of course, all kinds of high transaction count and numerically intensive problems into that. 
Unfortunately, most data center operators aren't as open as eBay is, but I think we'll see that change by the time that Facebook has a little bit more success with its open compute project and their servers, and we hopefully see some more data that is out there in the public. Let's go to the next slide. So if we, in fact, want to improve on the big data solution, and we need to achieve the accuracy and the speed goals, and we need to solve the power equals heat problem, then we have to do a bunch of things that may be a little bit unorthodox and different, but I think we have the need and identified a solution to a change of paradigm we need to decouple the system management and the transaction and numerically intensive operations. That means basically we have to have a CPU and a coprocessor or accelerator approach. And a lot of people have already thought about you know, basic accelerators. We've had accelerators for, I wouldn't say forever, but I remember 8086 and 8087, which was the numeric coprocessor, and the 8089, was, which was the I.O. coprocessor. And so the idea of having coprocessors is pretty old. It's just the way we do it, how we do it, and which of the parts of the problem we outsource to the coprocessor and make sure that we can solve the problem. And the problem is either high transaction count or numerically intensive problems that we need to solve. There are lots of problems in high performance compute. It's not only the scientific data stuff, it's also the the big data, and really, if you look at big data, what really is, is that big data is largely unstructured data, and unstructured data has really not only no structure, but it really has no value as it is to the company that has collected it, so they have to bring structure into the data that they have collected. And to do that, you can use MapReduce techniques like Hadoop, but the issue still is it runs on a traditional processor that has a lot of stuff to do that's not necessarily directly involved with the solution of the problem of getting structure into unstructured data. And on top of that, we still have an issue with current memory subsystems. Everybody today still seems to use DDR3, DDR4, GDDR5, stuff like that. And these are not very efficient and effective memory subsystems for a coprocessor, whether it is working on an unstructured data set or whether it is working on traditional high-performance compute problems such as matrix multiplications or financial modeling applications. So what we did was rethink that as well, and uh, we came to a bunch of solutions that we think will revolutionize the industry. Let's go to the next slide. So for us to be able to address the big data challenge, we need to use coprocessors. We also need to be able to make APIs available so that people have very little work to do to transition away from the current solution they have and use our coprocessors in both high transaction count and in numerically intensive applications. And we have developed a novel, massively parallel processor architecture that is much easier to program than current solutions, and it takes less energy to execute the tasks than any of the existing traditional processors. And into those, I include GPGPUs and other accelerators that we've seen in the last few years. GPGPUs have been a good choice for a while, but it turns out that they're inherently all 32-bit float, so that's a limitation. And the power consumption isn't exactly low on those either, and we saw that that poses a problem immediately when the first large-scale GPGPU accelerated supercomputers were introduced and run, and then we saw the outcome in terms of gigaflops versus the power consumption. And one of the reasons why very quickly, they were displaced by processors and coprocessors, such as Intel's Xeon Phi, was the matter of power consumption and the fact that they are mostly limited to executing single instruction, multiple data stream. So basically, all of them work on one identical problem with a different set of input data. And uh, we changed a whole bunch of that by not only 
attaching different kinds of memory, but also making sure that we have access not only to memory, but to many more cores. Because ultimately, if you've got to look at what scalability means, it means that you can get from one core to another core with a minimum amount of hops between the two. So the number and the latency of the hops is a very crucial measure. And of course, some little bit of secret sauce in it, but I'll get to some of that secret sauce in the next slide. So go to the next slide. Uh, what do we have in terms of the product and what are the attributes of the two processors that we are working on? One is, of course, it needs to be instruction and energy efficient. Right? And we have two processors that share a vast majority of the die in terms of technology development and in terms of building blocks. One is a neural network, actually more precisely a convolutional neural network. And the other is a floating point coprocessor that uses a new kind of arithmetic that is more precise and at the same time more power efficient than the traditional IEEE 754 floating point standard, particularly its implementation in silicon. So if you look at what current competitors do, they usually improve either per core performance or the number of cores, or they put in a useful system to allow the cores to communicate effectively. And in reality, you have to do all three of them at the same time and have to have improvements in per core performance. You have a larger number of cores, and you have a very efficient intra-core communication system, ideally with reduced latency for better system performance. We have that on chip, and we make it available off chip as well. And I'll show you to some degree how we can do that and uh, show that this would render a solution that's substantially more power efficient than anything that is in existence or even announced today. On top of that, since it's a coprocessor, it's platform agnostic. So it really works with all kinds of hosts. So we only have to write a driver and an API for each host and operating system combination, which makes it a relatively simple approach. And since we limited the number of operating systems we support to two, we basically support Linux, Unix, and uh, the latest versions of Windows 2008 are two and newer variants of Windows. So that's a relatively low impact for us, and it's thus a server only back end solution that we are targeting at this point in time. But as I said, it's agnostic. If somebody has a different specification for his back end, we can certainly do that. The next slide shows, in an overview, the P-scale coprocessor, what it looks like internally. So you see on the right-hand side, four blocks of hybrid memory cube host adapters. And that's the new type of memory that I was alluding to. The hybrid memory cube is a new type of memory that is distinguished from others by not only stacked dice, but also it does away with the multi-drop bus between the host and the memory. So this is a point-to-point -point connection between host and memory. And therefore, it doesn't degrade in performance when you add more memory modules, because the base layer of this hybrid memory cube memory already has one interface set to the host and up to three interfaces to secondary memory modules, if so required. So therefore, it always stays a point-to-point -point connection, and the bandwidth is substantially higher than anything you can achieve on DDR3 or DDR4 or even GDDR5. So we have four groups. One is the hybrid memory cube host adapter zero. That always has to be populated with a module. Then there is number one that is optional. Then two and three are optional, and four to seven, which are optional. So you can either attach one, two, four or eight hybrid memory cubes to each one of our processor. However, they can also be used to interconnect multiple P-scale coprocessors. So 
So let's say you've got the hybrid memory cube hosted after zero deployed for attaching one hybrid memory cube memory module. Then you can use the host adapter one to connect the second p scale coprocessor to it. If one coprocessor alone isn't quite good enough and doesn't give you enough performance, then those two can be connected directly to each other without any incremental logic, and therefore you can scale the number of gigaflops you need with the number of processors we have. Most host adapters are connected through a MUX and a DMUX, so basically multiplexer, demultiplexer, to our internal L2 cache controller, the L2 cache SRAM itself. All of that is controlled by the memory control unit. It's not really a memory uh, controller in the traditional way that usually we have in host CPUs today. It's, it's more a unit that maximizes the throughput and minimizes power use. And uh, helping in that is the power control unit that we have on the chip. The L2 cache controller then talks to a unit that is here labeled as load distribution unit because we will get a lot of different workloads onto the processor. The workloads can be anything from a, let's say, floating point application such as a matrix multiplication, or it could be a Fourier transform, or it could be some financial model that we run, need to run. So the load distribution unit will get that data set, the high-level instruction that it needs to perform. It will then go through a switch and distribute the load in a MIMD or SIMD fashion into any of the cores or all of the cores of the many core cluster that all have individual L1 I caches and D caches. So all of the load sharing and load distribution is done automatically. Let's say you want to multiply two matrices, then you basically issue the command matrix one, matrix two, and multiply through OpenCL. It goes ultimately to the load distribution unit, and the load distribution unit will figure out how many cores it needs and uh, whether it can run the problem as a MIMD or SIMD. So basically, if it's a task or a data parallel problem or a combination of both, and then issue both data and instructions to the many core cluster cores, any or all of them, and have that macro instruction executed. And then wait for the result. Once the result is back, the load distribution unit signals that to the cache controller, to the max DMAX, and then we issue through a doorbell interrupt the command completed so that the host can then pick up the results and get it into the host. So how do we implement all of that? Basically, this needs to go on a PCI Express Gen 3 16-lane coprocessor board. So we basically have the coprocessor. We have up to eight of the hybrid memory cube DRAM modules attached to it. In this case, we have four. If you want to boot that machine, it, of course, needs to be connected to a serial flash somehow. And that's what the interface to the serial flash is. And we have the interface to the host, which is PCIe Gen 3, the 16-lane interface. So we're working on a sample and a demo board like this, which basically means that customers who don't want to do any system design can just buy this demo board from us and then start playing with the software, with the firmware, and with the API, and figure out how they can use that to optimize their data center, their throughput, and the performance they have available to their internal or external customers. And the boards will be the same whether it's the floating point or the convolutional neural network coprocessor. Both of them are massively parallel coprocessors, each with 64-bit cores. And both of them deploy hybrid memory cube DRAM, so they, they 90% internally look the same, and externally they look 100% the same. Same pin out, same package, same everything. Since we were talking about high-performance compute, there are, of course, many, many applications in which you can think of 
the need of more than one of the coprocessor cards. And of course, we support as many coprocessor cards as the server has. PCI Express Gen 360 interfaces. And the good thing is the coprocessor cards can be shared among multiple servers. We've so far seen that if the simulations hold true, we can in fact exhaust the I.O. performance of about 16 servers with four of the coprocessor cards. So if you have four coprocessor cards, you can use 16 servers as a front end to those cards, and they will be very busy. They will, in fact, be doing nothing but feeding the coprocessor cards with data and with instructions and make sure that they are being used and the utilization is as high as we can get them. And uh, the API and the driver we deliver with this support this sharing of cards among servers, cards among host CPUs, and cards among cores in each of the CPUs. So there's no loss of context, use multiple servers to feed one or more cards. So that's probably the real application that we will see. Many, many of those cards shared among a whole bunch of servers, potentially an entire rack full. And we anticipate that this would be very likely the most widely deployed use of the coprocessors we have. With regards to the development status, at this point in time, we've got a simulation model that is covering nearly all aspects of P-scale coprocessors. With regards to performance, with regards to power, we are actually relatively certain that the numbers that we are uh, seeing can be implemented in an ASIC and can be sustained. So we can, we're very, very certain at this point in time that the finalized ASIC will show both the performance and the power numbers that we've seen so far in our simulations. And uh, if you look at how far the ASIC development has progressed, we have a whole bunch of building blocks available to us that we have developed in the past. We are using that to make sure that the coprocessors will be doing what we think the simulation model so far shows. And uh, at this point in time, as I said, we're very confident that the ASIC ultimately will match the performance that we've seen in simulation models. We've made pretty good progress on the ASIC. We have made a fairly good progress on the API, on the driver, and the software related to it. And uh, even the little bit of firmware that we need on chip, we've made it fairly good progress on that. I would say we're probably uh, right on target with regards to software and firmware. We're still a little bit ahead of where we think we should be in our ASIC development. So we, we are relatively happy with where we're at at this point in time. And we're raising an A round so that we can finish our product design and the engineering at this conjuncture, and we'll then hopefully continue full steam ahead once we have that money in the bank and uh, make those coprocessors available as soon as we can. We think that some of the building blocks that are non-core to the development are some things we can license out, so we'll hopefully get us a secondary revenue stream, and we'll see how that works out. But that's part of our business plan at this point in time. I think that you've seen that the hyperscale and all of the microserver markets that are coming online today, where you see a transition to lower performance, lower power, and lower cost host CPUs is taking place, that that is giving us a chance and a business opportunity for our coprocessors to either accelerate the compute that is there or to recreate abilities that have been lost by going from a relatively powerful processor like the Xeon to a multi-core 
ARM type processor, which for the most part is for data storage certainly good enough, but once analytics needs to be run, it's clearly not quite up to par and therefore it needs to be augmented by something. So we think this is a $2 billion annual market opportunity for SSR Labs that has come up and where we think we have a very good solution for this. Our design approach not only brings simplicity to the deployment of massively parallel processors, but if you look at our technology advisory board, we have pretty much every luminary on the tab that you could dream of, and they have all confirmed that our approach is the one that the industry will need to take if we want to successfully solve the challenges that lie ahead of us in terms of power and instruction efficiency when we at the same time need to solve the power equal seat problem. And I think, as you can see in a lot of trade magazines, the current disruption in server CPU choice that validates the market and its readiness to change to go to lower power, lower performance, and lower price, both CPUs, even in the server backend. Thank you very much. Now, ready to take your questions. Well, thanks for that, Axel. You know, the, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, this bit about the, the hybrid memory cube. And I was curious about the origin of, of uh, your architecture. Did the availability of that technology have a big factor to play in uh, um, why you did this project and how you did it? Yeah, actually, I've been <laughs> proposing a memory solution like the hybrid memory cube for I don't know how many years, but <laughs> it was certainly it was certainly even within the lifetime of my prior company, Perimix. So I would I would venture that I've been pushing for a memory architecture like that for close to ten years now. It, right? Because ultimately if you've got to look at what we have today, DDR2, DDR3, DDR4, even GDDR5. It's ultimately a multi-drop bus. You know, in, in technical terms, it's called SSTL2, a single-ended, step-terminated logic version two, right? And uh, while every single generation that there is, there is a lower power version and variant of it, and then it, there's another LP version of it. Right? We still have to break a barrier that basically makes it a point-to-point -point connection that makes it reliable, that makes it such that we can increase throughput drastically over what we really have towards a more reasonable number as to what we need, right? I mean, if you've got to look at CPUs today, right, you can get to a register in a clock cycle. It's not a really it's a non-issue, right? So if you then have a look at the number of registers on a die, and particularly if you look at an MPP, a massively parallel processor, how many thousands of registers you can have, right? the bandwidth that a CPU can have to registers is, is in the multiple terabytes a second range. Right? And now you have a look at your memory array, and ultimately with SSTL2, you connect up to four of those because then you know, total number of pins goes into the extreme. But you have four of them, and all you get is about 100 gigabytes a second, non-sustainable peak, right? So that discrepancy between the internal performance of a CPU and DRAM is so big that something had to be done about memory. And I'm glad that Micron got Samsung on board, and they are finally running with a memory architecture that is not SSTL2, and that is not multi-drop, and that is you know, just a high-speed serial link point-to-point -point connection, because that's what it took, and that's what it will need to get to a level of memory performance that supports a CPU, because if you've got to look at any modern CPU, right, you will find anywhere between I would say minimum 15%. I've seen CPUs with 25%. And you know even up to 30% of the die area, and therefore the power, being, occup <clears throat> being occupied by cache, right? And cache is, is basically, I wouldn't say non-productive, but it's 
it's hiding latency instead of doing something productive, right? So every single time you have to increase the amount of cash you put on a die, you hide latency that is really in your DRAM, which means that it's incremental power, it's incremental die size for just fixing what is wrong with memory, right? And so with going with the hybrid memory queue, we can reduce the amount of cash very substantially and at the same time get to much higher performance. When a single hybrid memory cube has 160 gigabytes a second bandwidth and that's substantially more than you get even out of four channels of DDR2, DDR3, DDR4. So if we can connect up to eight of those, we get to a, we get to a much larger bandwidth to memory than any of the Xeon, Xeon Phi's and other processors that are out there can ever get to because of the fact that we don't have to really deal with the deficiencies of the existing DRAM. But yeah. that's, of course, not all of the secret plus we have. There's a whole bunch more, but it's, it's one of the many things. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, that's the key, right, is being able to move data at high bandwidth efficiently, right? So, um, Axel, I wanted to ask you about the application environment. Uh, would this kind of a coprocessor, would it require something like CUDA, some kind of language, to rewrite the applications, or how, how do you think that would work? Well, I think the application environment, you know, we're very glad that AMD already took the hit and developed OpenCL. Because CUDA was, I think, a good first step into the direction of heterogeneous compute. But of course, CUDA was NVIDIA only. And CUDA didn't really foresee a bunch of things that I thought were essential and crucial to the success of it. And that, that's one of the many reasons why I think OpenCL is coming up more and more, right? So OpenCL is much more capable of a heterogeneous compute environment. And everybody who has already rewritten their application towards OpenCL, they can just replace the existing OpenCL API and the driver with ours, and then use our coprocessor instead of other coprocessors. So the, the application and the deployment environment isn't very much different from what's out there today. If you can use OpenCL today and you can make use of AMD ATI GPGPU, then you can make use of our coprocessor chipset. So Axel, kind of a wrap-up question here then. Uh, you know, people have perked up their ears and they might be excited about this technology like I am. Uh, how can they engage with you, like potential partners, at this stage in your development? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there are multiple avenues, right? One of them is we would really love to have a corporate partner who says, this is interesting enough to us that we're going to fund you. Because at this point in time, our level of funding holds us back from getting this done faster, right? And right. I think this is, this is true for every semiconductor company, right? You can do it on very little money, I mean, up to the point at which you need to make the mask and the chips, but you can do it on very little money. It just takes a very long time. Right? For everybody who needs this stuff urgently, well, they are welcome to contact me, and I'm sure we can work out a deal in which they can get either exclusivity or they can buy and be part of the company. Right? They can swap money for equity, and we'd be happy to work with them and do whatever it takes to get them to the solution they need. Because I think we've got the team on board, we've got the capabilities on board, we've got the talent, we've got everything it needs, you know, without, with the exception of money. That's what we are at this point in time lacking. We need, we need a partner who's hurting bad enough to be able to say, fine, we'll step up, we'll exchange money for equity, and we will. We will guarantee them we can make this work one way or another. Well, terrific. Well, Axel, I wish you the best with this. Uh, it's pretty amazing uh, what, what you're setting out to do here. And, um, yeah, I wanted to thank you once again for coming on the show today. Sure. Very welcome. You bet. Okay, folks, that's it for the Rich Report. Stay tuned for more news and information on high-performance computing.